Welcome to New Cage Arts Network, second annual arts evening of inclusion, songs and stories. And every year we, we, uh, we add more and more kinds of art. So um, we are so happy that you have joined us. My name is Joni Kalem and I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. And I am a musician and a storyteller and an inclusion advocate and an autism mom, I have lots of different hats. And I stumbled on JDAME, which is the Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month, February, a number of years ago. And of course, like anyone else, I said, why just one month? But we start with one month and we focus on this one month. And I have been, I am being joined this evening by an amazing cadre of artists. And all of us are going to offer somehow a, an angle, a perspective, an idea about what inclusion can look like, could look like, should look like, might look like, all those different ways of thinking about inclusion. So I want to invite up our first performer this evening. Her name is Caitlin McLaughlin. She is a cantorial soloist and songwriter based in the Washington DC metro area. She's a regular participant in the Jewish Songwriters Collaborative and the Jewish Studio and was recently chosen to serve as Cantor of Ose Shalom, a Reconstructionist congregation in Laurel, Maryland. And Caitlin is going to share a version, her version, of Elohai Neshama, which of course is the perfect inclusive prayer. So Caitlin. Thank you so much, Joni. It's such a pleasure to be here and in this amazing uh, eminent company. And uh, this setting of Elohai Neshama is fairly new. And this, is, uh, this prayer comes from our morning liturgy. And it tells us that uh, the soul we have been given is pure and holy. And it's a reminder to us that we are all on our in, in our insides made of pure and holy and eternal stuff. Elohai neshama shenatata bi tehorahi Elohai neshama shenatata bi tehorahi Ata verata, ata yetsarta, ata Elohai neshama shenata tabi tehorahi Elohai neshama shenata tabi tehorahi ata verata ata yetsarta ata start our evening. Thank you. So now I want to invite up 
my friend and co-organizer of the New Cage Arts Network. In fact, it was her, her request that got us moving in this direction. Cherie Carl Schwartz is a storyteller, an author, and an educator for the past five decades. She doesn't look a day over 20, though. <laughs> Sharing spirit-filled stories of wishes, wit, and wisdom with audiences throughout the country. Her own physical challenges have helped open her to the great need for more of the healing power of stories in our lives and with each other in the world. And she's going to share with us an Argentinian version of Beauty and the Beast, which I've never heard. So I am your first rapt attendee tonight. Shalom, shalom, and welcome everyone. In Parsha Mishpatim, a couple of weeks ago, we were told to not oppress the stranger, the widow, the orphan, or take the cloak of someone for they might not have anything to keep them warm. We can read this, do not take away someone's dignity, but offer help, bring them in. This Ashkenazi story from Argentina is from the Israel Folk Tale Archives in Haifa, where there are over 25,000 tales from throughout the Jewish world. My friend Barbara Rush, who worked with founder Dove Noy over six decades ago, sent me reams of IFA stories in Hebrew. I adapted this one as I saw its resonance with our theme. Once in a long ago, far away place, there was a king and a queen and their four fine daughters. One day there was a commotion out at the castle gates and the king and the queen rushed there to see what had happened. What is he? Who is he? Get him away from here. On the other side of the gate stood a hulking, misshapen mass of a man who looked like a metallic monster. Who are you? And why have you come here? They asked kindly. And he answered with a rough metallic voice. I once was a fine prince. A terrible warlock was very jealous of my family. And he, he, he cursed me and put a spell on me to become this monstrous shape that you see before you. The only way that the spell can be broken is through the kiss of a princess. Yet she must not know of these terms, but come to them of her own free will. Have her meet me at the edge of the forest close by. We can try to help, responded the king and the queen. And then the man hobbled away and disappeared into the forest. The next morning, the eldest princess was told, there's someone waiting at the edge of the forest. Um, please go and greet him and make him feel welcome in our kingdom. And so the eldest daughter went out at once toward the edge of the forest and suddenly there in front of her was a metallic hulk of a man. And as soon as she laid eyes on him, she fainted straight away. When she came to, he was gone. The next day, the second daughter was sent out. She ventured closer and closer. And yet when she saw the monstrous Hulk, she screamed, turn and ran away. On the third day, the princess went out from the castle, that third princess, 
Slowly, slowly she came to the edge of the dark forest and she saw this great hulk of a man, but she took a few more steps. Then she, she closed her eyes and she opened her mouth and out came, alas, I cannot, I cannot. And so on the fourth day, the youngest daughter awoke. She said the morning blessings. She put on clothes that made her feel good and that made her smile. And she made her way to the edge of the forest. And as she went, she stopped to pick some wildflowers and made them into a bouquet to greet the guest. Let me truly see him, she thought. Closer, she came. She saw ahead of her this monstrous looking shape. She walked closer. She stood in front of him and she took a breath and said, welcome, welcome friend. She felt her own heart beating. And it was as though she could feel his heart beating as well. And she looked at him once again. And her fear melted. She felt a tear running down her face. Then she looked deeply into his eyes and she saw a tear there too. She reached up her hand and she touched his face and then she reached up and she kissed him on the cheek. Now, I cannot tell you what happened next. I can only tell you that the beauty that they found in and within each other by truly seeing each other will last till the end of time. Thank you, Cherie. Oh, what a beautiful version of that story. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bring up Cantor Bryce Emily Megdal. And Bryce is, was ordained as a cantor in 2019 by the Academy for Jewish Religion, California and currently serves as Cantor at Congregation of Reform Judaism in Orlando, Florida. She is an at, Bryce, I have to tell you, um, on Friday I was Googling some version of a prayer and your YouTube was the first one that came up. And I was like, oh, oh I, I, I know her. <laughs> That's cool, what prayer was it? I can't remember, anyway. <laughs> One that I sang on Friday night. She is an advocate of self-expression and a passionate songwriter of Jewish music. She plans to record another album of her original melodies soon. And to learn more about her, you can visit www.bricemegdal.com. And she's going to tell us about her song, We Are All Blessings. Thank you so much. I believe that each and every one of us is a blessing. We all have worth and mean so much to so many people, but sometimes we may not feel this way when judged or excluded due to our differences. We often forget the value we bring to those around us. It is our obligation as Jews to be a light unto the nations. We can do, do so by having compassion and open hearts. We are also to open our eyes, not only to see the beauty in our world, 
but also to see what's broken and what needs to be fixed. What may help us with this task, tikkun olam, is to accept that we all have a place here and we all are the way we are because God wanted it to be so. We are all humans created in the image of God and thus are all blessings. No matter what we look like, where we come from or what struggles we have, each of us deserves to be loved, included, and empowered to be the best that we can be and change our world for the better. So this is We Are All Blessings. Feel free to sing along, clap along, dance along. to invite up now Mitch Gordon. Um, Mitch is uh, like me, both a musician and a storyteller, but he chose this evening to tell a story. He's a sacred drummer, a worship leader, a creator and player in the various sandboxes that are sacred spaces. And I already said this, he's a storyteller. He worked for many years as what was called at the time a special needs teacher in music and physical education and is the former president of the board of the, I'm going to mess this up, Rensselaer County Chapter of the New York State ARC in Troy, New York, um, the NYSARC. And he is going to st tell us a story, which I am excited to hear. Take it away, Mitch. Thank you so much. I think I'm unmuted. There we go. Thank you so much, Joni. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, yeah, Rensselaer County, ASRC, NYSARC. It's the alphabet soup. 
Well, about 30 years ago, the ARCs, the Associations for Retarded Citizens, decided to change their name strictly to ARC. It's because they were listening to the people they served who didn't want mail to keep coming to their home that said retarded on it. And I understand that very much. And my story revolves around when I was president of the board, I got to hear so many of our stories of the folks that we served. And this particular story between a job coach and one of our young men, one of our adults who lived in our program and worked in what we called supported employment at the time, was an opportunity to understand that we didn't just provide jobs. We really provided a place for everyone to maybe have their dream job. So many of us, I think, think about the fact that when you go to McDonald's or you go to a fast food place, you might see someone with a disability sweeping the floor. You might see someone with a disability cleaning a table. And that may be the job that they wanted, and it may also be the job that a job coach said, you can't do anything else, so go do that. I'm not going to judge. In our case, though, we were, we were pretty progressive in how we learned how to listen. And so this story is really about a lesson for all of us in deep listening, in active listening. Because I'm also convinced that when we remind ourselves as Jewish leaders, as Jewish educators, that in the Shema itself, the last letter of the first word of Shema and the last letter of the Dalad spells aid, witness, and we are all obligated to be witnesses, and especially to our brothers and sisters who may or may not be otherly abled. We have an opportunity to listen and to help and to understand and come into that. Rob comes into an interview with his job coach. Rob, it's good to see you. How are you? I've been looking forward to seeing you today. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here, Tom. Thank you for seeing me. Well, as you know, it's I'm here to talk to you about a job. We have an opportunity to place you someplace for work, and, and I'd like to know what you'd like to do. <laughs> well, I guess the thing I'd really like to do is I want a job just like my father's. Well, Rob... I, th I think that's a worthy a worthy idea. I do want to remind you, your 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 dad is a is a biochemist, and he works in science, and he works in a lab, and he works in a place that takes a great deal of education. I know, I know. I want a place. I want to work just like him. I want to be in a place just like him. I want to be just like my dad. Well, I think that's a great idea. So tell me more, Rob. Tell me more. What would it be? What would it mean to you to have a job just like your dad? Well, that's easy. First of all, everybody at my dad's work respects him. Okay. Everybody at my dad's work thinks he's important and they need him. Okay. And <laughs> my dad gets to wear a lab coat and it has his name on it. I've always wanted to wear a lab coat with my name on it. That's an interesting idea. Give me a moment and let me let me make a phone call. And and I want to see what might be available at your dad's lab. Hold on. You know, I've just spoken with the lab and here's something they told me. They told me that there's an opportunity there for someone to work in the mailroom. The mailroom what does that mean? Well, you'd have to sort the mail. And I know that you have no problem reading. You know people's names. You know the alphabet. And you know how to sort, right? You, you know alphabetical order. Of course I do. And you, and, 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 and you know how to get up and get to work. Of course I do. You know I do that. Well, maybe the mailroom is, is the right job for you. Let me tell you why. I said, well, why? I said, well, first of all, everybody needs their mail. It comes in from all kinds of important places, other labs, funding sources, maybe even a president from someplace. And they need their mail and they need it on time. So you would be important because you're the one who would deliver it to them. Hmm. Okay. 
And, you know, they'd want you to bring them their mail pretty quickly. So I'm sure they would respect you and treat you nicely because they want their mail on time. Hmm. That sounds good. What else? Well, it is a chemistry lab. So you have to wear a lab coat and it'll have your name on it. Really? I get to be in the same place where my dad is, respected, important, and a lab coat? What do we have to do next? Thank you. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, respect and being seen as the important participant in a community that one always is. Thank you so much. It's all about much. being seen, Joni, isn't it? It's all about being recognized. It's not, not just see me, but recognize me for the valuable human being that I am. Thank you, Mitch. Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, I, my goal for this evening is to make it through without crying, okay? Um, so we'll see if I get there. Sorry, I, I've given up on that, Joni. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably not a necessary goal anyway. So I am so happy to invite up Rachel Hamer. Rachel is a musician living in Lower Manhattan who writes and performs both Jewish and secular music and currently works for Tkia Music, doing tefillah and programming in many notable synagogues in New York and New Jersey. With her ukulele, she started as the cantorial soloist of her home synagogue, Temple Emmanuel, in Honolulu, before coming east to work musically in the 92nd Street Wise Summer Programming and the Hebrew Home and Manhattan Elder Community. So, Rachel, I'm so glad you're adding ukulele to this beautiful evening. Thank you so much. For the record, I didn't want that last story to end. I wanted to hear the next chapter. I was enthralled. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm thrilled to share some music this evening. Uh, I just put a link to a Google Doc if you would like to see the lyrics uh, and if you would like to see my contact information that is also there. This song, I just recently wrote it. You are among the first humans to hear it. And it is about opening your heart, especially to a child who may not know how to communicate, who may not have the tools to be able to meet you and it's called Love Song for the Disconnected Child.
listen let us connect i love that thank you so much and i love shaloha <laughs> so we are going to invite up rick lupert poetry superhighway and haikuniverse creator did i pronounce haikuniverse correctly it was not too far off okay <laughs> Do you want to correct it? <laughs> Hi, Haikuniverse. I mean, it's very, very close. Oh, I, okay. Haikuniverse. Yeah. Haikuniverse creator Rick Lupert, who hosts the weekly virtual Cobalt Cafe reading series. He is the author of 25 poetry collections, including the Tokyo Van Nuys Express. Did I say Van Nuys correctly? Yes, you did. Okay. I know I've been there. And God Wrestler, a poem for every Torah portion. He lives in Newhall, California with his family and three cats. And he has written an amazing poem. So go ahead, Rick. Joni, thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, it's, uh, I've been editing a book of poems I wrote in Hawaii last summer. I've been editing, editing it this week, and so it's so cool to come after uh, Rachel's uh, song uh, and to have that vibe in my head, which is already in my, my heart uh, this week as I've been doing that. Um, so, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. I have not spent a lot of time in my life Im immersing myself in this topic. And so I really appreciate uh, Ben Pagliaro's invitation or suggestion that I participate in this event. I, I spend a lot of time, as I'm sure a lot of us do, uh, this is a full disclosure statement, thinking about my own comfort, uh, thinking about how, how things could be, you know, is, is the temperature okay in the room? Is this chair the way I want it to be? Um, and so being asked to create something for this uh, made me really aware of how lucky I am to be able to, to think about those things. Um, and that further, that when I say how lucky I am, that too is just a really kind of selfish statement. Um, and, and it reminds me that I need to kind of focus outwards and remember that not everyone is so lucky. And not just remember, but, but uh, see what I can do and how I can participate in in uh, making sure that other people are as comfortable as they want to be. So with that in mind, I have this brand new poem, which also no other humans have heard before. I think it's possible my cats heard it uh, earlier in the week as I was writing it. Um, uh, I, it's, it's, I started uh, just with the title of the month. The poem is called Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance, and Inclusion Month. Jewish. When God made people in God's image, it was understood that that image had variations. No matter the number of functional limbs or whether one's eyes saw things differently than another's, it still counted as that image. Everyone entitled to make their own way, in their own way, into the house of prayer for all people. That's the kind of people we are. Disability. God only wants the heart, so let's say you need a special chair, or you had to learn a language with your hands, or like a documentary I saw when I was a child, you write checks with your feet. 
As long as you do these things heart forward, then your dis will fade away and all the ability you can imagine will reap the rewards. Awareness. Not everyone thinks like this. There are people who will insult the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind, even though it clearly states in the text not to do this. These are the actions of the spiritually disabled, the unaware. We must teach them how good and how pleasant it is when all people live together as one. Acceptance. When Larry David shimmied around the slow walker to get into the elevator in one of his episodes, he landed on the wrong side of acceptance. The differently abled are not our hindrance, but our reminder. Everyone has their moment. Everyone is diamonds and gold and everything precious. Everyone deserves a champion. Inclusion. Even if it takes a contractor, build the ramp, make the text larger, turn up the volume, make the aisles as wide as they need to be. Let all who are able in their regular way, let all who are able in their own way, let them all into our house. Month. A month is good, but why not two? Can we extend this half a year? Can that turn into the length of a pandemic? How about a lifetime? How about a generation or two? How about this becomes part of a future ancient text, pulled out of a mountain so our descendants, the scholars, can dust it off and say, see, this is why we do this. This is why we've always done this. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm I'm very, very glad that um, by inviting you to participate, you wrote this poem, which will now be there for posterity. And we can say, this is the way we've always done this. <laughs> I wish that was true, that this is the way we've always done this. But Thank you so much. And now I have the pleasure of inviting Helene Cates. Helene is another one of our New Cage Arts Network organizers. She is also the lead singer and songwriter with the Baal Shem Tones. She tours internationally, providing concerts and Jewish educational programs for all ages, except when there is COVID. She is ordained as a Megid Oman, and Helene works with individuals and their families to explore and strengthen their intrinsic bond to the Torah and mitzvot through the transformational power of story and song. And she's going to share a beautiful song with us called Into the Light. So my husband and I um, write a lot of songs together. This one, he wrote on his own, and I am very honored to share it with you. It came out of a discussion he had with a rabbi about something that was weighing on him, and the rabbi said, if there's something weighing on you, you should go speak to a trusted friend, because then you have two Yetzir Tovs against one Yetzir Hara. Right? So your friend has nothing, no skin in the game. It's just going to have only goodness. And of course, your goodness. So you put that together and it will guide you. And out of that came into the light. And regardless of what our situations in life are, either with physical things that stand in our way, emotional things that stand in our way, spiritual things that stand in our way, we have the ability to shed light upon a friend, and that helps in all those areas. May it be so. 
Well, we all need water. We all need air. We all need compassion when life ain't fair. And we all need someone when we wake up at night. Yeah, we all could use a favor. Step into the light. Yeah, we've all been busted. We've all been accused. We've all been cheated. Set up and used. And we all know someone who can set things right. Yeah, we've all been alone. Step into the light. Into the light. Talk to me. Yeah, we'll be each other's eyes. So we both can see. Yeah, we all fear the future. We all miss the past. We know that train is coming. Coming fast. We don't get no warning when lightning strikes. So we all hide somewhere. Step into the light, into the light, talk to me. Yeah, we'll be each other's eyes, so we both can see. Yeah, we both played with fire. We both played the fool. We'd each burn the other. You know that's true. Yeah, we made bad decisions. Got a few things right. And that sure beats nothing. Step into the light. Into the light, talk to me. Yeah, we'll be each other's eyes so we both can see. Lie, la 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 Thank you, Helene. Thank you. Oh, what a and wonderful And you're all song. bringing such light to the whole world in these moments. I can feel the light shining through the screen. <laughs> May we all be blessed to uh, feel each other's light. And with that light that we feel, that it just grows and grows and grows. And uh, Mashiach now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. So next up is my friend Tanya with Soaker. Tanya is another organizing member of New Cage Arts Network. She is a Jewish educator and storyteller. 
interested in using story to spark understanding and build connections. Tanya says there is always a story to share for every subject and every gathering. She's a proud she's proud to be a member of the New Cage Storytelling Cohort number one. And she presented last summer at New Cage 12. It was New Cage 12. Okay. <laughs> so Tanya, I'm going to mute. Take it away. Tell us what your story is. In Bereshit, we learned that we're created Bethselen Elohim in the image of God, all of us. And sometimes, sometimes we forget to see that. In July 2016, an elderly Shoah survivor passed away in New Jersey. Like Elie Wiesel, who passed away in Manhattan just one day later, Theodore Halpern once lived in France. Both men were an inspiration, speaking out about their wartime experiences to audiences of all ages. Teddy Halpern's name, though, is not as well known as Elie Wiesel's. His story shines a light on our ability to look past disabilities, to see the image hidden there. Do you see me? Really see me? <laughs> Why do I ask? I was born disabled. I quickly learned most people looked at me. They, they looked at my stunted arms and my deformed missing fingers, my crooked legs, my special shoes. They looked at the scar on my lip from cleft palate surgery. They didn't see me though. They didn't see me. They didn't see Teddy Halpern who would become a, a loving husband, a, a proud father of a son who served in the Marine Corps a man with a successful career, a man who worked against the Nazis when he was just an 11 year old boy. You, you might see me a bit more clearly now, yes? When I was born in 1930, Vienna still seemed like a good place for Jewish families like mine. My parents were secular Jews and Vienna was a vibrant city full of Jewish organizations and businesses and schools and synagogues. 10% of the population of Vienna was Jewish then. But by 1938, my parents knew they had to leave. The Nazis entered Austria, ready to cement their anti-Semitic platform and begin their program of Jewish genocide. We had family in America. My parents applied to emigrate. My mother was approved. And my father was approved. My sister was approved, but not me. You see, even in America, disabled people like me were not seen past our disabilities. The American immigration process then was in line with the Nazi propaganda. Disabled people, they're a drain on resources. They'll marry and corrupt the population with their bad genes. My parents were distraught, but the immigration attorneys told them to leave me with my grandmother for the time being. Once my family settles in America, it will be much easier to bring me over. My grandmother tried to keep us safe. Oma took us to Belgium. Then we fled to Paris. We had relatives there. We would be much further from the German border. But then the Germans invaded Paris. Our street was bombed. I was separated from my Oma. The police pulled me from the rubble, but they didn't see me. They looked, they saw my disabilities, I couldn't understand when they spoke to me in French. I was very obviously physically disabled. They took me to an insane asylum and left me there. Finally, an aide looked at me and did see me. I had somehow managed to request paper to write a letter 
to my parents. And the aide realized I knew how to read and write. I spoke German. I knew my parents' address. I was intelligent. And I was immediately re removed from the asylum and taken to live in a convent. The convent was also a home for orphans. The nuns sheltered and cared for us. And this was fortunate. I was only about nine years old. War was raging all about us. Disabled persons, Jewish persons, and certainly a disabled Jewish child would have been taken away by the Nazis. But after almost two years with the nuns, I realized they didn't see me either. They wanted me to convert to Catholicism. I may not have been the most informed Jewish boy in France, but I knew who I was. I ran away with another Jewish boy in the convent and we found the partisans. Partisans, those fighting against the Nazis, brave men and women living in hiding, carrying out dangerous missions, dangerous missions to disrupt the Germans, carrying information for the French resistance, rescuing whomever they could. The partisans looked at me, but they didn't see me. They saw only my disabilities. Take this boy in, feed him and protect him. He's of no use to the resistance effort. He can only add to our risk. An 11 year old boy who can't even walk properly. By this time, I knew French quite well and I was determined to be seen for who I am. And I let them know how much they needed me. And so not even 12 years old, I became a courier, a message boy for the French resistance. Anyone on the street looking at me was, of course, not seeing me. They saw a crippled boy and turned away with pity or disgust. And that's why I was able to move throughout the city freely. Who would suspect me of carrying messages for the resistance in the hollowed out heel of my special shoe made extra thick to make up for my shortened leg and crooked foot. I was invisible to the enemy. Risked my life every day fighting against the fascists this way and I survived until 1944 and liberation came. After the war, my parents sent for me and I came here to America and I found people who paid attention who noticed me, who really saw me. I learned English, went to college. I found work, I married, I became a father. Disabilities did not matter. I did the things that people do, even retiring to Boca Raton and having a bar mitzvah at age 79. Do you see me now? Oh, Tanya. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. What an amazing person who, um, who had the wherewithal to use his disability in such a way. And what an amazing rendition you have given us of his life. Thank you so much. Uh, so next. And, and everybody, once you've performed, look through the chat because I can't read it now, but I know there's all kinds of amazing stuff coming through there. Benjamin Kintish. Let me call up Benjamin. He is a new friend of mine, a chorus teacher, a cantor, and the creator of Life Review, the hospice musical. I'm like, Okay, I got to hear this. It's Fiddler on the Roof meets a chorus line set in a residential hospice. Learn more at lifereview.com, Instagram at 
Life Review musical. So Benjamin, make sure you put that in the chat afterwards. And now take it away. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for including me. Uh, professionally, I'm Benjamin Kintish, but we're among friends, so you can call me Ben. Um, ben P. reached out to me about tonight and wondered if I could share a song from my musical. I, I chose to share the one I'm going to sing in a moment. Uh, picture, if you will, the very elderly African-American Leroy Washington, born in Bedford-Stuyvesant when they still had trolley cars in Brooklyn. He played uh, organ in some of the largest black churches in Brooklyn for nearly 70 years, from his debut as a 15-year-old until when he retired from playing at 85. And he only did that because he had a stroke, which rendered one hand um, unusable. And then he couldn't play anymore, even though he wanted to. Um, this song and the character who sings it is inspired by a real life person who I met in hospice care. Details have been changed. Um, but what I remember about him is that he taught me, a, a young healthy man, about how to be grateful for the blessings of the human body even when it doesn't work as well as we want. So this man wished that he was able to play the organ and make music as he used to. And even though he was sad that he couldn't, he still sang praise for God and the blessings of the human body. You'll hear a little bit of a gospel flavor uh, reflecting the musical heritage of Mr. Washington. Um, words written by myself, Ben Kintish, Jason Spiewak, and Andy Bosov. Music by Jason Spiewak, Spiewak and Andy Bosov. With these hands, I played for the Lord. When the preacher spoke, I prayed with a call. The choir filled the room each Sunday with song. And every holy key struck hammer was blessed to play along. With this voice, I sing the Lord's praise, alone or in harmony. Oh, sanctify our days, yeah. Through melody we spoke the language of love. Gratitude for life and for the audience above. With these feet I raised to stand up. Oh, when they needed us. Oh, I raise my hand up with his voice. I sang the Lord's praise, alone or in harmony. Oh, making holy our days. Oh, yeah. Through melody, we spoke the language of love. Gratitude for life and for the audience above. With these hands, I played for the Lord over and over again. After the preacher prayed, after the preacher prayed, we all said amen. 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 Woo. <laughs> Thank you. 
I can't wait to check out that musical. Awesome. And thank you for bringing Leroy to our evening. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do something a little different now. We, um, we are inviting up my friend, Barbara Bierenbaum. And, you know, most of our evening tonight has been focused on words and music. And Barbara is going to share with us some movement so we can all have a bit of a movement break. Barbara has decades of experience teaching a variety of creative arts, academics, and Jewish studies to folks of all ages. She holds a California teaching credential since 1989, a Master of Arts in Jewish Education since 2014, and has been growing her passion for leading Israeli folk dance since 2007, teaching weekly sessions on your feet in person and on Zoom, and in your seat on Zoom, especially for those with mobility challenges. So talk about the way to make something inclusive. I love the fact that Barbara is joining us tonight and um, sharing how movement is not just for those who can get up and shake around. Movement is for anyone. So Barbara, I'm going to mute and I'm going to move along with you. Awesome. Thank you all very much. I'm excited to share this program, which I um, developed obviously, as it says, for folks who have want to enjoy the ruah and the love of Israeli folk dance, but that have issues with balance or sound <laughs> and oh dear yep more sound sorry sound She's coming in here we go so we'll put the music on Hava Nagila of course our favorite and our best piece to do so you can stand up if you like this the movements that we do that I'll call out if you can hear me over the music will be available to you if you're standing and you have a little bit of space that's all you need. And even if you're sitting, you just need really a little bit of space, enough to put your arms out and up and kick up your feet. That's all we're gonna do. Um, so enjoy and follow along. Sing along if you want to as well. This is my one of my favorite versions of Havana Gila. Ah, my, I see my microphone is actually dying. So I might, you might just have to actually follow along, even if I can't tell you what we're doing, because I can't get up here and do this. And one more time, one more turn. No, I'll just keep the music a little bit lower. Hopefully you can still hear. All right, here we go. How about now? Ah! You can hear the music, yes? Okay, so can you hear my voice at all? Probably not. Can you yes, even so, oh yay. Um, Barbara, okay, here we can go. turn the music down a little bit, then we'll be able can. to hear. And you can still hear me, and can you hear the music too? What happened? Because it stopped. Well, now we can't hear the music. <laughs> How's that? Okay, cool. So we're going to grapevine. Open up your legs and cross. Cross your arms and your legs and switch your cross when you come back. That's good for your brain. Open and cross. Very good. If you're standing or sitting, you're going to do the same thing. Open and cross. Here we go. Move back. And cross. And open and cross. Very good. You got it. You're going to lean back a little bit. Hold your core nice and tight. Now here we're going to kick twice. And cha -cha -cha. Kick up. Cha -cha -cha. A little tap. Flip your foot. Back. Add some arms. Up high if you like. Very good. Now to your left. Ooh, We're going to march in our horror step and kick. One and the other. March for kicks and kicks. March and kick. Very good. Excellent. Back to the straight, great fine. Opening the cross. Reach. 
and switch. Very good. The valley runs the clover hides. Back to the flick flicks and cha cha. Keep it. Cha cha cha. Cha cha cha. And work. Good. Roll it up. Push the roof. Raise the roof. You guys look terrific. Now we're going to turn left, turn right. Now we're going to march. March and kick. Good. Breathe the day. Take it away. Dance, dance, everybody. Open. 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 enjoyed wonderful thank you all for coming being a good sports and coming along and i am doing this program on zoom so you could join us i'll put the my contact in and if you're interested in something like this i would love to welcome you so i'm sure everybody is reawakened now <laughs> and ready to welcome up my friend ben pagliaro who is a Jewish singer-songwriter and worship rapper. You're going to follow that, Ben. Um, ben is based in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Rabbi Bailey Romano, and his cat, Motzi Lechem. And he just released, this very past Wednesday, his second album of Jewish music, this entitled Ashrei, Songs of Joy and Happiness. There it is. Great picture. You can check it out wherever you listen to music. So, Ben, thank you for being you and being here tonight and everything you do for New Cage Arts Network. Amazing. Muting. All right. Thank you, Joni. Thank you. It's so, so great to be here. Um, and I am going to be sharing a song that was made famous on TikTok, of all places. There's this trend going around where a songwriter makes a song and then they open it up and they say, hey, I would love to hear a verse to this song. Go ahead, write a verse and duet me, which is the fancy way of saying, make your own part and recorded after me. So that's what I'm here to do tonight. I uh, I took this song, it's called The Muffin Song by Sean Bertram. And I was thinking about this evening, right around the time that I was thinking about this song, and I decided to reach out to my cousin Lauren. And I wanted to ask her about her relationship with her boyfriend and see if I could, with her help, write words to this song. I wanted to include here a picture of Lauren and Alec. Uh, Lauren's actually here tonight, which is so wonderful. I'm so glad you're here with us, Lauren. And uh, she wanted the song immediately, so I, I got right to it, and, uh, and this is the result. Here's the muffin song. <laughs> The 
first lyric is Sean's. I'm your muffin man. You're my muffin girl. Let's get together and we'll see the muffin world in a car, in a plane. We can muffin every day, always forever in our little muffin tray. You're my muffin bay. I'm your muffin boo. Let's get together cause we got loving to do. You're so far, I want you near, cause you're my muffin dear. Scooch on over and plant a kiss right here. Cause I love everything we get to do while we're on this earth. I will love you. This would sound lovely on a ukulele too. And here's what Lauren had to say about Alec. He is very kind. He thinks I'm kind too. God bless you. Now that you mention it, he said I'm kind of cute. He thinks I'm funny and I'm sweet. I'm glad we could meet at the grocery store. Alec and me, you can find both of us in the bakery aisle. When I think of him, oh yes, it makes me smile he works hard every day i like him that way he could be himself and i think he's pretty great yes i love everything we get to do while we're on this earth I will love you. You can sing with me the last time. I love everything we get to do while we're on this earth. I will love you. I love you, Law. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone, for, for listening. Thank you, Ben. Oh, that's so sweet. I, I know nothing about this trend until Ben told me about this trend. It sounds like a wonderful trend. <laughs> As social media trends go, it sounds like a great one. So I am going to invite up now. Leora Lazarus. And Leora is a best selling children's book author. She's an illustrator, a storyteller. She is a preschool and supplement school, supplemental school teacher, and an independent Jewish educator and consultant. Her mission is to empower Jewish parents and teachers to bring Yiddishkeit to children. She aims to pass along our Jewish birthright and foster a love for our traditions in each brand new generation. And Laz and Leora is going to tell us about this great story that she's going to share with us this evening. Tonight, I'm going to share my story with you. Some time ago, a new child came to our school. This child came already with a label. This child is difficult and competent. Now, I've always had a problem with labels. I think it comes from my past. As a young child, my first year of elementary school, my teacher labeled me. This child is retarded. You should never let her stay in school. She will never amount to anything. The law in South Africa stated that I had to stay in school until I was 16. There's no place 
for this child in mainstream school. This child needs to go to the Forest Town School for severely handicapped cerebral palsy children. My teacher could not see my invisible disabilities and decided to label me something that suited her idea of me. Fortunately for me, I am an educator as a mother and she was not going to stand for this. My mother advocated for me and I remained in mainstream school. These days, my diagnosis would probably be dyscalculia, dyslexia, ADHD. Those days, retarded. Now, although I struggled my entire school career, it did form me into the person that I am today. And because of my struggles through my education, I was determined to become an educator and to help educate children so no other children would have to go through an education the way I did. I didn't want any other children to be tormented the way I was tormented. If I could just save one child from having as hard a time as me at school, just one. It was not easy becoming an educator. Book learning has always been very, very hard for me. But with plenty of encouragement, I prevailed. All right, now back to the child who came to our school. This child was already labeled difficult, combative, and nobody had even met this child and didn't even know what they were like. But I was fortunate enough to be the teacher assigned to this class. In the beginning, we need to get, know, get to know one another and it took us a long time to build trust. But soon this child started to open up to me and I discovered that this child lived in two different houses. Both homes and parents were not on the same page and he was not supported with his disability. One parent helped this child and the other parent did not. And it always became apparent at which house this child had slept that night. I could tell by the remarkable differences in the behavior. However, I did find out that this child really wanted to be my helper. So they did not have to compete with any of the other children. Our bond grew stronger and stronger and I was lucky to be moved with this child. And we had formed a great relationship. By the time Sukkot came and we were learning about egg frogs, this child told me that they had never seen the inside of an egg frog before. So I promised after Sukkot we would cut open an egg frog and I would fulfill my promise. I did a little research and found out about growing egg frog game that's really difficult. But I told my class this honestly. And we decided we would try. We opened the etrog. The smell in the classroom was just unbelievable. And we planted the seeds. This labeled friend of mine took care of these seeds. And none of the seeds germinated. But instead of this child getting angry and frustration, we decided to try again. Two years ago, when Sukkot arrived, I put out a message to the community, let's get some more etrogim. And we were lucky we could plant them. It came to Tubishvat 2020, and we eagerly planted our beautiful saplings. A month later, you know what happened in 2020. There was nobody to water these etrogim. And unfortunately, None of them survived. However, this year, we decided we are going to try again. And last week, when we came back in person, we planted our new etrogim. And these etrog seeds are an important reminder to me 
and to everyone else that with perseverance and strength, you can survive. Sometimes there are many obstacles in the way. And sometimes it might take seven years to bear fruit, just like an natural tree. But never, ever lose faith in yourself or in your students. The little etrog tree inspired me. And this over here is how our original etrog tree looks right now. I took this photo yesterday. A little thing can turn into a big thing. And patience and love can nurture a child just like we can nurture our etrog seed. Wow. I had no idea that that's what a trog trees looked like. <laughs> thank you, Leora. Thank you so much. And thank you for that story. And obviously, um, I can totally, totally hear what it is that you yourself had to, had to live with. And, um, and we can all turn around and um, gently tell that kindergarten teacher of yours back in South Africa that mm, mm, uh, missed that one big time. So I am now going to invite up my new friend, Helene Mann. Helene is a retired behavior specialist and autism consultant for the Hawaii Department of Education, Leeward District, Oahu, and has over 50 years of experience working with children with disruptive behaviors, building relationships with them to facilitate their learning. She was the director of the School of Jewish Studies at Temple Emanuel on Oahu, Hawaii, and in her youth, she was a comedian and a belly dancer. She says that was 60 bellies ago. During this pandemic, she multitasks. She crochets the occasional scarf. She writes the occasional poem. She paints the occasional painting, all while binge watching TV, which I find fascinating. So, Helene, you have a wonderful poem and story to share with us. Helene, you're muted. Now, can you hear me? Important. Uh, Shaloha. I'm glad to be the third person here who mentions Hawaii at JDAIM. Um, the poem I wrote and the story I'm about to tell you uh, are dedicated to my daughter. And I want to show you her picture. This is my daughter, Sahara. You see? This is, there's a, um, yeah, there she is. You can see it without the glare. She left me way too soon. She died from uh, complications due to severe cerebral palsy when she was 14. And everything I do is in this field is dedicated to her. Uh, she is, continues to be the love of my life. I didn't just love her, I inhaled her. She, she is my inspiration, my teacher. She's my Rebbe. I'm going to re recite the poem now. It's entitled, Now I Am Held Deep in the Fortress, which is a shout out to my dad. Hey dad, because he used to hold me deep in his arms and recite this poem. This is actually a paraphrase of Longfellow's poem, The Children's Hour, the first sentence. Anyway, here it is. A wall of their own making, a fortress to protect, not from wind, not from rain, but from the light, too bright, too bright, noise that causes pain, a self-constructed edifice to protect from the feel of touch. Too much, too much, a touch too light, fire ants crawling without and within, a need of flight to reduce the agony, a cocoon of silken threads on skin woven so tightly, so tightly to avoid the touch, to keep out the light, and reduce the need for flight. Now waiting, so still, waiting for someone who will gently pull on a silken thread, lightly, so lightly, unraveling bit by bit by 
bit, creating an open it, opening to let another in, to allow someone to win trust and slowly, slowly pain reduce, to lessen what has been, to help introduce into society for all to know the humanity that's been waiting to be seen. And now, thank you, my story. Let's see, because I, I do have notes, because I'm still pretty new to this, let's see. My job, uh-oh, hold it a second. Did I, unmute, did I mute myself? No, you're good, we can hear you. Okie dokie, I thought I pressed the button that I shouldn't have pressed, okay. My job was to go into the classrooms and train teachers how to work with children who had behavioral issues and who were on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. So I was working with a, a preschool teacher and a preschool class. And I entered the class one day and there was George sitting in a corner, lining up his cars, talking to absolutely no one, making no eye contact, completely in his own cocoon, his own world. And then the teacher announced, nap time. So everybody went and they got their nap, nappy stuff, they, they had mats and they put it on the floor. And uh, George was lying on his mat, on his back, with his legs crossed like this, Taylor fashion, crisscross applesauce. I had never in my life seen a kid lie like that to sleep. And I thought to myself, there's a sensory issue here. He needs input into his joints and he needs stretching of his muscles to relax enough to sleep. So I sat down next to him and I began massaging his upper arms and his calf muscles and he fell asleep. So I got up. To leave and he grabbed my arm he grabbed my arm this was the first time this kid had made any kind of contact physical contact with anybody from his own volition he wanted me to stay he took my arm and he put it back on his arm and so i continued i purposely came in every day around nap time just so that i could be with george and i could help him sleep about maybe a week later i was there for circle time and he came up to me and he sat next to me and he looked at me and he said, Hyene, my name. He called me Hyene and that's the first time he said anything. And it was also the last time he said anything because he didn't say anything again. We went for about maybe two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month. He walked into the class one day and he announced, daddy come pick up. And after we picked up ourselves from the floor, because this was the very first time this child had said a full sentence. He'd said my name once, then nothing. And then he came in with an absolute full sentence and we were delighted and he was delighted. He was jumping all over the place. He was yelling, daddy, come pick up, daddy, come pick up. And daddy did come pick up. He picked him up at the end. And what happened, what was happening was they were leaving. They were leaving the state. So I called his mother and uh, I was talking to her on the, the uh, speaker and George was listening and he started crying. I said, why is he crying? She said, because he's looking for you. He was looking around, he couldn't find me. So I, you know, we talked a little bit more and she thanked me profusely for helping him. He had not talked until he had been in that class. He was now talking more and more and she was so happy and thankful about that. This story has an epilogue. Last month I called, I spoke to them. They're somewhere on the mainland. And I said, how's he doing? She said, well, he, he's okay. So let me talk to him. So she put him on the phone and he said to his mother, mom, what do I say? And she said, answer her questions. So I said, how are you, George? And he said, okay. I said, do you remember me? And I told him my name and he said, no. And I said, uh, I started to ask another question. And he said to his mother, mom, can I get off the phone now? And she said, okay. And again, she thanked me and I got off the phone and I thought to myself, what did I do for this child? I held, opened a door and he walked through the door. I created a Kesher with him, which is Hebrew for basically a tie that binds a connection. I made that connection with him. And because of that and whatever else was going on, he was able to start functioning and to talk. And more than that, he didn't just say a sentence. He, he said a story. This was his story. He came in, 
He told us what he was thinking. He told us what he was feeling. He was saying, my daddy is coming to pick me up and I am so excited. Wow. And I thought again to myself, I think a lot to myself. I thought he gave me a gift. He gave me a gift that was worth more than the price of rubies. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. And you have this amazing miraculous experience with this student and as as educators i'm sure many of us have had that and we've had the same experience that years later the kid doesn't remember you <laughs> you know what i left out was that this was a perfect conversation because he didn't remember me and he didn't want to talk to me exactly. and that was fine because he conveyed all of that to me Exactly, exactly. And so instead of being insulted, you have the maturity to be able to celebrate exactly. <laughs> I, what I was about. like, yeah, exactly. yay. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So to all our audience, we're, we're coming into the landing. We have, um, we have three more presentations. And I want to invite up Rebecca Mirsky. Rebecca is a freelance cantor and part-time cantor at Beth Shear Shalom, Beth Shear Shalom, Beth Shear Shalom in Santa Monica, California. She has five secular albums and is working on her third album of Jewish music. She lives and loves in Los Angeles with her husband Lawrence and Dizzy and Django. I don't know who Dizzy and Django are. Um, and Rebecca will tell us about her song hello everyone can everyone hear me first of all yes okay good uh, <laughs> um so this song that i that i'm about to present i wrote at the at this uh right after the 2016 election that i was very upset about um but we won't go into that um, but I, I was thinking about a utopian version of, of what I would wanted the United States to be. And so I really, I wrote this song and it's become, you know, kind of an inclusion anthem for, and, you know, sung at some, some synagogues and other events. And, um, I hope that you enjoy the sent, the sentiment of it. And, um... I tried to I tried to include uh, as many people in the in the song, as many kinds of people in the song, as, and but I'm sure I've I've left someone out. But you'll get the point, I think. Some need wheels to get around, and some can use our feet. Some eat only vegetables and some of us eat meat. Some need to be sober and some can drink a beer. We are all, we are all welcome here. Some of us are brown and some of us are white. Some wake up real early and some prefer the night. Some of us wear burkas, some wear headphones in our ears. We are all, we are all welcome here. We are all. from the south some of us believe in God and some of us have doubt some of us are straight some are trans and some are queer 
Just as your song points out, inclusion takes some stretching. Takes some stretching to make this a welcoming place because we're not all the same. We don't have to be the same to be included. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing that. Okay. I am thrilled to invite up now my friend Nina Gelman Guns. Nina is passionate about sharing the wisdom of Musar, this 1,100-year-old Jewish tradition examin examines inner character traits in relation to life situations. We learn to pause, tame our reactive response, and instead show up to ourselves and others as our best self. Nina has been nourishing Jewish and interfaith learners for over three decades. JDAME participants are invited to join a monthly Musar splash or acquire Jewish bedtime materials at worldwideweb.pitom with an e.com. So Nina's going to tell us about her story. Wonderful. Thank you, Joni. Uh, you just mentioned stretching, and we're in the very home stretch and I encourage you to just take a moment <laughs> and wiggle your arms, feel your shoulder blades, feel your sit bones move so that we can just settle for the last few offerings. Sometimes the still small voice carries the most power. A couple years ago, as our lives got turned upside down and we didn't know what was normal, we weren't quite sure what we could touch, whether we could hug, did we need to wash our vegetables, and what supplies would we need in the, we didn't know what the world is now. So I too was in my rush of acquiring and I found myself in line at a CVS waiting. I don't like lines. And I was impatient. I wanted to make my purchase and get on my way. As I slowly made my way up in six foot increments, I was next. And in front of me, a young woman, slim with just two items, had found two containers of disinfectant wipes. She put those big containers on the conveyor belt. They went forward. 
and the cashier rang them up. She handed her money and the cashier counted bills and her expression changed. She looked up at the woman and she said, it's not enough. And I noticed she was weary. She probably had a very long day. And she wasn't quite sure what to do. I saw the mirror of the young woman, the mirror in her eyes of panic. She'd finally found two containers of disinfectant wipes. She said, just a minute. And she dashed out to her car with her long brown hair flying behind her. Didn't take very long before she came back. She had a handful of change that she put on the conveyor. And again, the tired, weary cashier down at the change, took a deep breath. She had a pained look on her face and she looked the woman in her eyes and said, it's not enough. I saw in both of them just pain and confusion. I heard an intake of breath around me as people waited to see what was going to happen. And I felt my impatience. In that moment, I remembered a quote by Victor E. Frankel. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space, there is a power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. In that moment, curiosity came to me and I wondered about that pile of coins. Why did she have it in her car? How did it happen that she gathered all those coins? Who needed those wipes? Who was waiting at home? How many stores had she been to so far not finding wipes? And what else was in her day in this stop until the next thing that had to happen? In those moments of curiosity, I found my heart. And I found compassion. I looked at her and I said, what do you need? And she looked at me like a deer caught in the headlights and said nothing. I reached into my wallet and I handed her one dollar. She looked at me, not saying anything. And I said, take it. In a still, small voice, she said, thank you. She handed the dollar. It was enough. The cashier finished the sale. The world returned to its buzz and its sound and its deep breaths of people relieved around me. And she left. I'll never know the butterfly effect of that one action. But I was grateful because of my listening and discerning practice of Musar that I heard and saw another human in need and offered compassion and a dollar. And I'm thankful and grateful. And in the way of all things amazing, I did not know the details of your story, 
but um, the song and story that I am about to share totally <laughs> follow perfectly. Thank you, Nina, so much for that. That was so beautiful. And we are at the end of our program. Um, I am your last performer for the evening. I, I realized, of course, that I should have had someone else introduce me, <laughs> but <laughs> here we are. Um, so if there's anyone here that wasn't here at the very beginning when I did introduce myself, my name again is Joni Kalem, and I am a singer, a songwriter, and a storyteller, and an educator, and a teacher trainer, and a mother of a now almost 27-year-old who has autism. And I came to this work of inclusion um, because I had always worked with cross-cultural. Somehow that had always happened for me. I went to Israel as a teenager and got involved in Jewish Arab work and in Israeli-Palestinian work. And so I was very deeply versed in cross-cultural things. And then I became a mother, and then I became a mother for a second time, and my two children live in two different cultures. And I had to apply my ability to be a cross-cultural worker um, through the autism slash neurotypical cross-culture. And that has been the greatest lesson and learning of my life. As Helene Mann had said, her daughter was her Rebbe and her teacher. Both my children are my teachers, and sometimes the lessons go easy, and sometimes the lessons don't go easy. So I want to finish us out tonight, first of all, thanking everyone that came, thanking everyone who contributed a performance to this amazing evening. Thank you so much to our incredible sign interpreters. Rivka, I want to watch you sign. Thank you to yourself. There we go. <laughs> and, um, and I want to finish us with um, a story about the Lamed Vavniks. There are lots of different stories about Lamed Vavniks. Lamed Vav are two Hebrew letters that translate into the number 36. And I'm not going to tell us the story tonight, but there are wonderful, wonderful stories. You can go on my YouTube channel to see my most favorite story. But I want to share with you the song that I uh, wrote about Lamed Vovniks. And just briefly, the premise of these 36 sparks of light, angels, righteous people, there's lots of different ways that we can interpret that, that we can translate Lamed Vavnik. There's 36. And the idea is that this spark of light travels constantly around the world and inhabits different people. It's not like you're born a Lamed Vavnik and you die a Lamed Vavnik, but at some point in your life, you may be a Lamed Vavnik. But in inimical Jewish fashion, there's a riddle that says, if you think you're a Lamed Vavnik, you definitely aren't. But if you're sure you're not, you might be. So, just as Nina was talking about how do you know what's going on with someone else? Well, how do you know that you're not talking to a Lamed Vavnik? How do you know that that person in front of you is not carrying that spark of light? How do you know that you're not carrying that spark of light? How do we know? And if we know we don't know, maybe we might treat each other differently? Well, we just never know. We just never know who the angels are. If 
you want to sing along harmony with that one. And we just never know. We just never know who the angels are. There's a story told in whispers about a little plan. All through time there have been the wise ones found throughout the land. A group of angels spread around in secret near and far. Not just one, not two or three, thirty-six there are. And we never know just who they are, and they're not who we'd expect. Not the leaders, not the loud ones, the famous or elect. Maybe they're a swither, hang on. <laughs> Maybe they're a little odd, the ones with eyes we don't meet. The sweet woman, no one's got time for the old man down the street. Cause we just never know, yeah, we just never know who the angels are. No, we just never know, we just never know. Sometimes they are children, often they are poor. They work in humble silence, no spotlights, no rewards. And as we hurry through our lives, so busy in our days, how many angels do we meet along the way? And if you're wondering why that number, it's all a little math trick. Eighteen is the number of life times two is thirty-six. The thinking was we needed help, and that's what these folks do. But they don't even know themselves, it's a secret to them too. And we just never know, we just never know who the angels are. We just never know, we just never know who the By the time we've understood what might be going on, we turn around in quiet awe, but that spark's already moved on. Cause we just never know, we just never know. No, we just never know, we just never know who the angels are. So, and as I'm speaking, singing, my angel is calling. <laughs> I am going to take this off of speaker view so that 
I can finally see everybody who's here tonight. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you to all our performers. Thank you to everyone who came to join us. And um, may this be an inspiration for the rest of February for each of us to stretch because to be inclusive requires stretching. And as Rick so wonderfully said, a month, why not two? Why not 12? Why not every day? So let's, let's take this inspiration from all of our performers tonight and please send it forward, share it forward, pay it forward. Thank you all so much for coming. And um, I'll, I'll go through and read the chat afterwards. So if anybody direct messaged me, I so apologize, but I just could not multitask and get <laughs> start reading. So thank you all for coming. And, and